about two weeks ago, uh, Coach Aranda came and asked you all questions about your restorative practices. And so can you just give a general overview of what that is? Sure, but restorative practices and Wiley, we've decided we were going to adopt four critical strategies that every staff member was gonna get trained on um, over a period of three years. We have a pilot school, seven first year, seven next year, seven the final year. Um, and basically they get trained on circles, community agreements, effective statements, and SEL. And what's been the biggest surprise that you all have seen from that? I think for me, the biggest surprise is just how impactful that this can be. I mean, it's kind of been something that's been ingrained in me from, you know, my parents from when I was uh, little of, of how to approach different situations, but how impactful it can be whenever it's a, a structured system like this and, be, and putting it into play with a whole school. And Cody, we're gonna stay with you for just a second. I wanna just introduce a clip to everyone. This is from the movie Waco, which obviously happened uh, just a, down the, the road a little bit. And it really looks at two schools of thoughts. And so this is an intro. And Cody, I just want your immediate reaction to this clip. There's a paradox to power. The more force you bring to a situation, the more likely you are to meet resistance. If we could spend some of those resources training agents to negotiate, I guarantee that you would invest a lot less in body bags. We can't talk our way out of every situation. This is a good thing, Gary. Show of force helps bring people to the negotiating table. When I see that, I don't, I, that's not how I look at things. It's, I, you gotta listen to your people. That's what I, I think when I see that, you gotta listen to your people. And that's one of the biggest things, you know, with our, you know, uh, leadership team, with my admin team, one of the best things that I can do is close my mouth and listen to them speak. And then after I get all that information, it helps me as a leader make the best decision I can. You're nodding your head. <laughs> Getting people on board to do restorative discipline is really hard, especially for your veteran teachers. Um, it's a new way of looking at things. You know, this is the way I've done it. And, I don't, you know, no, we're going to give them attention. We're going to send them to the office. Um, and the biggest... Can I say something to that? <laughs> I just want to literally, because this is, it's revolutionary for coaches, at least the ones that I've observed. I watched a conversation when an athletic director said to a group of coaches, we're no longer going to use punishment as a strategy. And I promise you, one of the coaches said, if I can't make them run, how am I gonna get them to do anything? Think about that. When it goes back to relationships, like when you, when you think about it, and one of the biggest misconceptions was restorative practices was, that was what discipline was turning into. And that's, there still needs to be consequences from time to time with actions that kids that, or people take. But when you develop those relationships and you put these systems in place for those that maybe struggle with developing those relationships, like with the circles and the treatment agreements, um, that, that helps minimize the amount of discipline that you end up having. And to that point, I mean, look at the, uh, the, can you just describe the significance of this stat? Yeah, so when you look at a campus who's implementing restorative practices and who has come to the table and discussed discipline at all and what discipline looks like and what it looks like for a kid to come to the office when they come to the office when they don't um, it shows in their data they have obviously less office referrals um, but if you think also about the staff's view of the principal because i'm sure when this person said we're not going to have punishment you then had to have a conversation of why you weren't doing that and now there's this whole new discussion of what does discipline actually mean? And it's about changing behaviors um, and really investing in the whole kid. And can you talk about circles? Yeah, so circles is one of my favorite strategies that we do. Um, it's basically just a systematic way that we schedule time into the school week to meet with students, ask them some questions, get to know them a little bit, they get to know us a little bit. Um, it's also an opportunity for you to address class concerns, um, but really it's just for them to get to put their voice in the room, um, to get to share their thoughts, uh, dig a little deeper into the purpose of why they're learning what they're learning. And Ryan, I, we asked you, what are some of the most common office referrals that you get? And you did that for our coaching lab. Can you just share what you said? Oh gosh, talking back is probably the biggest one that they get sent down for, and just a disrespect. And um, I think one of the things that happens is 
why restorative has been so good is sometimes as the adult, you want to have a, a calm conversation, but sometimes teachers get a little heated too. And um, this has allowed them to kind of, let's step in the hallway and kind of start those affective statements like, why are you feeling this way? And can you help me with, instead of sending them directly to us and I get the phone call of, okay, I'm just done with this kid today and I can't handle it anymore because he's cussed me out or he's talking back. And I mean, not that children would ever cuss at us, but. Um, <laughs> You, know, well, not you were saying that. some uh, uh, vaping, vaping was happening. Yes, that happens at my school. Uh, some social media trends. Social media is huge. So when you say come to the office, I mean, that's not typically what a teacher sends down for. That's me getting a phone call at 7 a.m. on the way to school from a parent or an email that said, Susie just called my daughter da -da 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 on social media. What are you going to do about it? You know, and so um, a lot of our job is social media now and having to deal with um, girl drama. That's a huge one. Um, or they're planning a fight or something. And so um, I would say using circles for our girl drama has been really good. You bring them in the office. Um, and the whole idea is to repair that relationship, to restore it. Like, what can we do at this table and talk? Like, why, why are you feeling this way? Why are y'all saying these things to her? 99% of the time, it's because of a boy or something stupid. But um, it totally disrupts the day when that kind of stuff happens because somebody sends a snap about it and then the whole school's talking about it. And so um, those are definitely things we deal with. But I think going through these trainings and knowing those affective statements and being able to um, train our teachers, which takes a lot of trust to get them on board because some of them don't want to... They just want to send them to the office because that's what we're used to being able to, to do. And it's like Cody said, that's not always the right answer because I may not be their safe person. You know, the teacher needs to form that relationship. And when I think about circles as well, it's not just for the kids. Some of the most powerful circles we've had this year have been with our teams and our counselors have helped us tremendously with setting up circles. And, you know, you think about it with kids and with adults, it could get possibly get weird, but it's not because the, when our circles are set up, I would talk to my counselors, Ms. Packabush, and just say, Oh, this is what we're struggling with right now. And with her mindset, she would be able to come up with an amazing circle with an amazing talking piece that helped. Usually those meetings ended with uh, me finding out a lot more about what's going on on my campus and why it's going on. And, you know, laughter, tears, all of that. But it's that was the most impactful times that we had during our meetings this year is when we had circles with the adults, which also gave them, you know, a resource or just being able to see how that works with us so they can take it back and use it with the kids. I understand how well versed you are in, in sport. Why do you think more coaches don't do this? I don't know. I mean, as somebody earlier talked about that people usually are approach things the way that they're used to seeing it and the way that they were approached. I coached for, you know, for four years, but I, I approached things in that manner of not in your face, not direct. I would get to know my kids, get to know my athletes. And I, I don't, maybe it's sometimes they're scared to step into that and, and, you know, take some of the power back from them. I don't know. Marcella? Yeah, I think it's time consuming and it feels yeah. like it's taking away from the real work. Um, but what I've seen is teachers actually gain a lot more time back because they're not dealing with some minor things that are happening in the classroom. That's one. The other thing is they know their kids uh, at a deeper level. They know their kids better. Um, they understand why some of the behaviors are happening, happening and um, it just helps them be seen as more of a person that they can trust. Um, so, but I understand that time crunch. And so it's just kind of committing. That's why I think the system has helped us so much because there's also people who are uncomfortable having those conversations or we've talked about a teacher who that's just not their thing and um, because it's a requirement, it's kind of forced that relationship to happen and we've seen great growth in some teachers, um, especially teachers who they are so good at their content area uh, and not necessarily the relationship piece, that this has just given them a tool to use to build those relationships. It's just so powerful. I just wonder, how do you get the coach to buy into that with the time piece? So we're in for the long game. So that's why we introduced the bike um, in the sense that we're really trying to change mindsets and help people see that this is beneficial and this is a different way of disciplining children and building relationships and so our goal really is to move quickly with those that are already on board for those that are struggling 
find a connection, find what a struggle is for them and help tie it back into circle, to help tie it back into community agreements um, so that they can find a benefit that they are seeking based on the need that they have. And the biggest benefits for community agreements for you all has been what? For, for me, it's been just a voice for all. The biggest thing about community agreements or treatment agreements, they're called different things, but you know, there's a quadrant and it's, you know, how the teacher wants to be treated and the teacher's able to voice, this is how I want to be treated. And then the kids have an opportunity to be able to voice, this is how we want the teacher to treat us. And just giving them that voice. And it's a fluid document. One of the biggest things, it's a fluid document. So as you go on throughout the year, those things need to change because you, you're, you're good here, but now we've moved on to this. And we've had this issue here. So that's, it's, it's just another structure for somebody that maybe struggles with that. They're able to put it up there and give everybody a voice. I think it's been great for first year teachers too. It's just a great tool for them to use um, because they come into it not knowing exactly what they're gonna do and lost. Um, and then some of your veteran teachers who have lost kind of some of that touch with kids, like what's in modern or cool or whatever, they're able to learn some of that verbiage and stuff like that. But I think what Cody said is that, that it's a fluid document. And you're able to go second semester and say, oh, we're not so worried about getting out of our chairs anymore. We, we've learned that, we can take that off, but we may need to add that we need to be on time to class or whatever it is. I mean, it's, and there's nothing like earth shattering in there, it's just respect. It's that kind of thing. I think one of the uh, affirmative statements is like, it bothers me when you're acting up in class because it's taking away from my learning. So it allows, the class to have a better structure and they're learning more, I think. I think you go, when you, and I, you, you, you talked to me earlier about time and we all have, you know, through a, a thing we go through with PLC, professional learning community, we, we talk about, we all have the same amount of time. It's how you use that time. If you watch the national championship game this year, University of Georgia used something that was called skull sessions. It was circles. That's what that was. It was circles. And what the, they decided to do was take some of their time to get to know their athletes and their specific position groups better. And you see how that ended up. One of my favorite lessons I've learned from you all is that 90% uh, of the discipline issues come from 10% of the population. And if you think about that with teams, the hardest thing for coaches is when their best player is in the 10% because they have such an influence inside the locker room. And can you just speak to how circles can help mitigate some of that damage? Yeah, so it really, the reason you're in a circle is because it takes away a hierarchy, right? So we're all on the same level. And so that helps for students to be able to see each other. And it also helps them to hear the voice of some that don't maybe speak up as often. Sometimes you have those that are more verbal or who get all the attention and it really kind of equalizes things in the classroom. It's helpful. And Cody, we're gonna bring Dave Aranda out here. He came up, like I said, a couple weeks ago and just asked you all questions on how to take this into his environment. What was the biggest learning for you based on the questions that he was asking? I don't know, first of all, it blew my mind that Dave Aranda was taking notes from us. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting there and I still it talked was still, to him. It was like. Yeah, I mean, his notes, but um, what was the question again? I'm sorry, that, that, <laughs> that one. It really blew you off. away, yeah, man. That blew my mind. I, I still felt right, sitting there. He and took him a picture of how many notes he was taking because we were like, oh my gosh. Yeah, <laughs> he's got such small handwriting. When he's asking the questions, okay, what are you thinking about with the questions he's asking? How to not make this this weird, this for, for that, you know, group of individuals. And it, it, it just made me think about how intentional we need to be with what we're doing. And it just made me process and think about, um, you know, again, how intentional we need to be with that. I think that's the best word you were used was intentional. Just watching him speak and his demeanor and his calm is very inspiring to me because sometimes I can get very worked up over things and overthink yeah. things and worry about things. And um, I want to make sure I'm being a good leader and make sure I'm being compassionate and make sure I'm listening to all of my people. And when he asks us questions, it's just been very reflective for me as a leader myself, like, man, maybe I should have thought of it that way. And I think that's what we're going to do now is we're going to bring out Becky and Dave and they're going to talk about how they're taking it into their environment. And what I would challenge you all to do is think about how you could bring this into your environment and what would be some of the reservations that the people that maybe have been in your environment a while would have and how could you overcome those barriers? I'll give you all a couple of minutes and then we'll bring them out. Thank you very much.